ladies and gentlemen, making his way to the mic, he is the pro wrestling savant, the host of the hottest wrestling podcast on the internet, Nerdy D. What is up, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the most distinguished pro wrestling podcast on the internet. The seven burning questions with the pro wrestling savant. I am your host, the savant himself, the most underappreciated, hardest working voice in pro wrestling, Nerdy D. And joining me tonight is my beautiful wife and valet, the lioness Lauren. What's up, y'all? Each and every week, I break down the seven most important questions in pro wrestling. And each and every week, I call it like I see it. Unlike the wrestling establishment of sheep who pander to the masses, all while posting links to their cash apps and Patreons begging for donations, I'm not looking for any money. I'm just here to talk my shit. Mm -hmm. So we took, we've been taking little breaks. We haven't been, we haven't been flooding TikTok with quite as much. uh, I bet they missed you though. (laughs) It sounds like it, right? Mm-hmm. Still, still, still seeing an uptick in followers, still seeing a lot of positive uh, comments, but also seeing a lot of negative, okay. which, which is what I, that, that's what I fucking am here for. I'm here for yeah. the negative. I enjoy the negative more than I enjoy the positive. I said, unfortunately we get more followers when I'm not in the comments than when I'm in the comments. Cause when I get into the comments, I stir up problems and bullshit and and so recently the trend did once again that everybody that everybody's jumped on the bandwagon is I'm just too negative. Okay. I'm just I'm too negative about everything. But the the response that they don't understand is those are clips designed for TikTok to get a fucking reaction. And we're mm-hmm. getting the reaction, the exact reaction we want. And anybody who comes over and listens to the full podcast understands that those are small tidbits that usually lead into the things that I like. Mm-hmm. So I just, I I thought it was funny because I actually saw one of our listeners comment that back to somebody. They're like, no, you got to go listen to the entire podcast to understand that's, that's not, most of these aren't the real opinion. Most of these are, are things said designed. They're like commercials, Uh right? Commercials are, are, they're designed to get a reaction so that people then look deeper into what I say. That's what we're shooting for. And if not. I'm, I'm completely fine. Just pissing people off. That's never been a problem. Right. Yes. But this last couple of weeks, there's a, there's a motherfucker who's gotten on my nerves. Okay. Who? And I started off trying to give this guy a chance. Okay. okay. This kayfabe Cody. Do you know who I'm talking about? Chris Griffin. Yes. Chris Griffin has answered basically almost every fucking video I put up mm-hmm. where I ask a question. And what you don't understand is I start off every segment by asking a question. Mm-hmm. I'm asking a question, a generic question that I might even know the answer to. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> but to promote interaction, I'm asking the question. So he takes those questions and he answers them in the most dipshit way possible. Yes. Always speaking to me as if you're somehow, dumb and don't understand. Somehow this dude who sits in his fucking car and responds to TikToks all fucking day uh-huh. is, is somehow superior knowledge to mine. Mm-hmm. Come on. Cody, you just, this is a, this is a fucking thing. You don't want to start with me. <laughs> I've already put to sleep three or four motherfuckers on TikTok. Yeah. Put them to sleep night, night. They're fucking gone. They don't want anything to fucking do with me. They, they end up sending me fucking messages on YouTube and, and instant messengers and shit like that. Trying to fucking reconcile. But once I've laid you to rest, you're laid to rest. There's no mm-hmm. coming back from that shit. And I've tried Bye. to like, I've tried to like Cody. I did because actually the first interaction where he came at me, <clears throat> I went back at him mm-hmm. and we actually kind of had a laugh about it. And yeah. so I was like, all right, <clears throat> if, if, if I can dish it, I got to be able to take it. That's yeah. fine. If we can go back and forth. But then all of a sudden he just starts coming in with, oh, you fucking stupid and shit. Like, no, Cody, come on, man. I guarantee, I fucking guarantee, Cody, that my IQ is twice what yours is. Yeah. You know, so don't. Don't light a fire. You don't want to fucking don't do it. Don't light. The you fire. don't know what you're getting into. Don't, don't give me a fucking reason because mm-hmm. that's when I'm at my best. I'm at my best when I have a fucking a target and I can assassinate. That's my fucking best. All right. 
All right. But let's get into the seven burning questions of the week. So last night on Monday Night Raw, we saw yet another unsuccessful title shot for the EST Bianca Belair. Mm -hmm. And for what seems like the eighth straight week since SummerSlam, Bianca Belair has been cheated out of opportunity after opportunity to hold the Raw Women's Championship, the SmackDown Women's Championship. It seems like she can't get a fair shakedown in any match she steps into. Mm -hmm. So the question is, can Bianca Belair get a fair shake at Becky Lynch without her cheating? Or is this the end of that program for right now? And where does Bianca go from here? So like I said, since SummerSlam, it's been match after match after match where Bianca has been cheated mm -hmm. out of an opportunity uh, at, at a title shot, right? So we, we go, let's, let's talk about SummerSlam where she's supposed to fight Sasha Banks. Mm -hmm. And then she's told, no, you're going to fight Carmella. Okay, which definitely is a step down, but you know, you're mentally prepared for that match and you're ready to step in with Carmella. Then all of a sudden, out of fucking nowhere, Becky Lynch shows up and reaches out to shake hands, does her little dirty, her dirty shit that she does, mm -hmm. hits her with the, I think it's called the manhandle slam, which is just her ripping the fucking rock off. I don't care that you asked the rock to use the move. You're still stealing the move from the rock. So she used the manhandle slam to finish Becky Lynch in 26 seconds. And since that moment, Becky Lynch has cheated her way one time after another to retain that belt. Now, all of it's not Becky's fault because uh, it was at, uh, what was the pay-per-view where, where Sasha Banks came back? Um, that wasn't Crown Jewel. That was, that was before, right Crown, before Jewel. Crown Jewel. I don't, and I, I can't slips remember my mind. But so then Sasha returns and fucks up that title opportunity. Mm -hmm. uh, I think she had a title opportunity at the Raw Women's Championship against Charlotte Flair, where Becky Lynch stepped in and fucked up that opportunity. Yeah. Then at Crown Jewel, we all know how that went down, and I just, I feel like at this point, it's it's time for Bianca maybe to to kind of set her sights on something different for the moment. Maybe, maybe clear your mind. Becky's inside her head and it's time. This, this last match on Monday night raw where Becky pulled the turn back, uh, turn buckle off. Mm -hmm. She's just good. She's just that good. She just, she's one step ahead right now. Bianca needs to, she needs to go and fight some other talent for a little bit and see, see if you can kind of get your swag back. Yeah. You got to get that. Sometimes you get, it's like the yips, right? You get a couple bad things happen and, and you fall into a bad rhythm. And now I, I think she's just grasping and it's desperation. It's how many times I need another shot. Give me another shot. One more <laughs> shot. And I think at it's this like point, gambler. it's exactly right. It's like a gambler at this point, even if it's been unfair and I, I'm look, I am a Bianca supporter. It's been unfair. She's been cheated every step of the path that she's walked. She's been cheated, but it's time. Just clear your mind. Go look for some new blood. Mm -hmm. build your record back up, build your confidence back up, build your swag back up. Let's go into survivor series, not chasing Becky Lynch. Let's set our sights on someone like Sasha Banks. Let's, let's rally. Bianca could rally together the raw women's roster, mm -hmm. put together a hell of a team and go into survivor series and just smack the shit out of, uh, of SmackDown and, and just kind of rebuild that swag, rebuild that confidence, build back up that, that EST. Cause yeah. right now, like, it just seems like she's being cheated. She's the ED, the cheated. Uh -huh. It's not, it's not going well. Make, she needs to make her presence felt in the WWE. And then after survivor series, make your presence felt on raw run. Let, let Liv Morgan have a little bit of time with Bianca, uh, with, yeah. with uh, Becky and go run through the Carmella's, the Queen Zelina's, the, the Natalia's, the Rhea Ripley's run through those people. And, and and rebuild up just that confidence. There's a confidence. There's an air of confidence when one. you're winning, right? Zelina versus her. Yeah, yeah. Zelina's just too little, though. She can't. I mean, Bianca's strong. There's yeah. one thing about Bianca. She is strong. She is physically strong, and she's not one of those people who just comes off horribly physically imposing looking. Uh huh. But she is strong and super athletic. Which is so. I'm gonna kind of lead into so Becky Lynch now. It looks like uh, we're getting a tease of of Becky Lynch and Liv Morgan, which this this is where I go. I go. I, I try to praise WWE for a, a couple weeks, right? And mm -hmm. I try to go. Oh, I'm I'm really back into it. I'm really feeling it. And then you do this booking thing where you book uh, 
Becky Lynch against Liv Morgan. Now, Liv Morgan is coming basically off of an unsuccessful program against Carmella, right? Yeah. And last week, I think I, I listed Carmella as one of my most underrated wrestlers, which I stand by that. I think she's getting better and better. Her character is fun. She's never going to be the top dog, but she fits in that mid card real well. But you got Liv Morgan, who's coming off of a program with Carmella, where Carmella kind of humiliated her a little bit. Mm -hmm. Just match after match, Carmella was was uh, shutting her down. And so now, now we're supposed to believe that these people come out of these programs where they lose, and it's the same with Seth Rollins, right? Seth Rollins got his ass beat by Edge. Now Edge is gone. Same with Liv Morgan. Liv Morgan got beat up by Carmella. And, and all of a sudden, instead of Carmella getting the opportunity, it's Liv Morgan that's being teased for a raw women's title shot. And I don't know if that's just a tease. I don't know. Are, are we going to continue this Bianca thing? I don't know. How long can you run that? It's been a really, really good program. Yeah. It's and- been fun. But at a certain point, Bianca's either got to win or it's time to let her win somewhere else. Let her do some things to, to build that confidence back up. Right. Mm -hmm. And then we go, well, okay. We've also got to start talking about survivor series, even though WWE is basically fucking pretending like it doesn't exist at this point, because we've heard absolutely nothing. We're now two weeks out of crown jewel Mm -hmm. and we have heard absolutely nothing about survivor series. We know nothing we were teased pre uh, pre Crown Jewel that if Big E won, yeah, he would face Roman Reigns. We've heard nothing about that match. We've heard nothing about uh, nothing about a match of a uh, four on four Survivor Series style match, mm-hmm. either men or women. And Survivor Series is November twenty first. I man. So we're barreling down on this thing. Hopefully on SmackDown, we can start laying some seeds. But I at this point, I don't know. Like. I don't even understand, though, using Survivor Series as the pay-per-view coming out of the draft. Because Bianca's been on Monday Night Raw, what now? Four weeks, right? Yeah. Is that... Or the draft officially... Like, two weeks. It's two weeks because the roster switch took place Mm -hmm. right after Crown Jewel, right? Yeah. So, she's been on Monday Night Raw for two weeks. Where the fuck is your allegiance coming from? I don't think like when you're traded to a new team, you don't have that much team spirit in week number two. Yeah, it takes time. I think this is a pay-per-view that's better suited to be almost right before the draft. And and then then it shakes up right after that. But Mm -hmm. but it is what it is. And this is where it falls. And we know nothing about Survivor Series, even though last week I did a Survivor Series predictions that I can't. I don't know if I'm right or wrong, because we literally know nothing about Survivor Series. And we don't even know, you know. I don't know where Edge is. I don't know what the four on four is going to be because right now it looks like all the top talent on Monday Night Raw, they're all kind of pitted against each other right now, which has been fun, right? Mm-hmm. The Finn Balor, the Kevin Owens, the the Rey Mysterio, the Seth Rollins, tying them in with Big E. That's been fun. I've yeah. enjoyed that, and I'm going to talk about that later. But as far as Survivor Series goes, at this point in time, like WWE kind of acts like it doesn't exist. True. And so this is where... You know, I try to defend WWE and then everybody comes in and goes, hey, man, they, they got bad booking. And I go, well, they, you know, they tell a good story. And it's like, well, there's, right now they're not telling any fucking story. Mm-hmm. All right. So question that was on the wrong. Uh, that entire thing was on the wrong disc up there, but that's all right. So we'll just get a bunch of comments telling me, why are you talking about that when Roman Reigns is above you? Uh, okay. So question number two. There's been a lot of chatter from the wrestling world about Bray Wyatt's non-compete finally ending. There was speculation that Impact made a big push to grab a hold of The Fiend. It was even rumored that he had been in Hollywood shooting a movie project. The question is, will we see Bray Wyatt in a wrestling ring in 2021? And if so, what company will he be representing? So there was a long, there was a big part of me that was holding on to hope that this was all a big work. Yeah. That, that somebody in WWE was smart enough to go, you know, if we play the pissed off role that tends to work and we can have him come back, you know, just a monster again and, and, and pissed off and upset. But I think the WWE ship has sailed. I agree. I think that there's been some bad blood said and some things, some nasty things said on both sides. Not really on both sides. It's on WWE side, mm-hmm. which they tend to do. They kind of throw mud at people, mm-hmm. which is which is fucking stupid, right? And then Bray came back and he was kind of like, "Look, 
I'm going to tell my side of the story. This is bullshit. Fuck you guys. This is what happened. And the rumor is, is that uh, it really went downhill when Bray Wyatt made comments about the way WWE creative worked. Mm-hmm. And so I guess the, the rumor is that Vince McMahon didn't like that. He didn't like Bray Wyatt speaking out. Uh, I do feel like WWE is the best fit for Bray Wyatt, though. That's the yeah. problem here. WWE does these Undertaker, weird, dark, strange characters better than anybody. Now, did they misbook Bray Wyatt for the last fucking five years? Hell yes, they did. 100%. They have misbooked Bray Wyatt for the past five years and, and just completely destroyed a character that should have been Undertaker-esque. Even mm-hmm. could have been bigger than The Undertaker, I think, if they did it correctly. So that leaves, now we got... Uh, with Ring of Honor gone, which I don't think that was even an option, we've got Impact Wrestling and we've yeah. got AEW. Mm-hmm. I think Bray Wyatt's too big for Impact Wrestling. I agree. I think he goes to Impact Wrestling, he's lost. It's the same thing I said about Braun Strowman. Braun may be a better fit, but I don't know. I don't love seeing Braun Strowman on Impact Wrestling. Those guys, when you come out of WWE, you're almost too big. I don't know the numbers for Impact Wrestling, but yes. I feel like it, it's it's got to be kind of a leap and bound behind AEW and WWE. I don't think it's even registering. And now that they've done the thing, uh, impact has severed their ties with AEW. They're not going to share wrestlers anymore. Okay. So now impacts, kind of, you know, I mean, I guess at a certain point it felt like a one, a one sided relationship. Okay. I felt like, you know, I just watched the impact guys on, on, uh, AEW, but I never, I never vice versa and watched it the other way. True. I've, I don't think I've ever seen a full episode of Impact. I don't even know what it comes on. Me either. So that's what I'm saying. So if Bray Wyatt goes there, it, I'm not going to watch. No. So, I'll never, so he's just gone. I'll be RIP, basically, bro. Yeah, basically then Bray Wyatt is gone from my wrestling brain. He won't do it. So then, what does that leave? That leaves AEW, right? Mm-hmm. But where does he fit in an AEW? Because like... Darby what, Allen. What? Don't say that. That's stupid. My bestie. Don't say that. Does, so does he get his own faction? But AEW is is like what about 30, the Dark Order three hundred five. Yeah, they but they gimmicky to me. Bray Wyatt, he he's not gimmicky in the sense of like hokey. He needs like so. I thought like Malachi Black, could he come in and tag with Malachi Black? I could see that. But are there characters a little bit like? Uh, conflicting like what if he they... was no longer the fiend and went well he's back... not going to be the fiend because that's yeah. owned by wwe oh, okay. he's going to have to come up and and that's why uh people were alluding to the fact that he may be shooting a movie but i think he was in uh, hollywood with that guy who makes his mask mm. and i think he's building a new character yeah and so i do think we'll see him again in 2021 for sure i think there's no question about that and i do think it'll be a w i just I don't fully understand, and I don't ever claim to, to understand all the time that I, a lot of times I have no clue about things that they do, and they're, they're perfectly, they come out perfectly great. So, mm-hmm. but it, I, I don't know where he fits. I don't, because do you, you give him a faction? Do you, I mean, do you bring him in with Braun Strowman and recreate like Wyatt Family 2.0? I think so. That would be so cool. You could, you could do that, but is it, you know, AEW fans, the thing I've learned, and, and I made the fucking mistake a, a week ago or two ago about having just a real fucking opinion of going, look, AEW's losing me a little bit, right? Mm-hmm. I, I'm not as entertained by it. Doesn't mean I don't watch it. Doesn't mean I don't even, like, see parts of it I like. It just as a whole for the for the two hours on yeah. Wednesday, it's not fucking holding me. Mm-hmm. Now, I also have I've conceded to the fact that them moving it to Saturday for two weeks in a row mm-hmm. fucked me up because that's not good on my schedule. Yeah. That doesn't work. That means Friday I got to watch like three hours of wrestling. Typically, we watch SmackDown on Saturday. So I had to cram all that in, then watch Saturday. Then there was a pay-per-view Sunday, and I fatigued out. That's what happened, right? Yeah, it's a lot at once. But AEW fans, they love this this thing, right? They love to come out and say, the WWE is so gimmicky. Mm-hmm. The WWE is theatrics. AEW is real wrestling. Yeah. First off, real wrestling is what you see in the fucking Olympics. Okay? Uh-huh. That's real wrestling. Everything that comes on network television is sports entertainment. Yeah. You can't argue that with me. The, and the argument, and, and we had someone, we had uh, uh, one of our followers named Vince McMahon something, don't remember, 
I have to fucking look it up. Okay. But he told us, and I loved this because this was exactly right. Every time they tell, you know, they, they say, oh, WWE's the gimmicky show, right? What about Jungle Boy and Luchasaurus? That's about as gimmicky it's as a, you it's fucking It's a dinosaur head. and a guy in Tarzan, basically, yeah. right, who rides on his back. What about Malachi Black? He's a cult leader who... Who, like, disappears, then comes back. He yeah. spits shit in people's face. Mm-hmm. Like, all right. Cool. And I look, I got no problem. That's the part of wrestling that I enjoy. These people think that they're talking shit to me when they go... They tell me, oh, well, you're a sports entertainment fan. You're not a mm-hmm. wrestling fan. Yeah, no, no, you're right. I, I don't get off on the part of the grown men hugging and, 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 like, rubbing on each other. Yeah. Like, I could do without that. Mm-hmm. I like the story. I like the theatrics. You I like the entrances. It. I need the lights, the music. I need all the story to understand why the two grown men are fighting. For sure. Because if not, they're just fighting. Mm-hmm. And it's not UFC fighting. So it's not, it's not fighting. Right? So I don't like the argument that, that the AEW fans present to me where they go, well, you know, you're just fine. Get out of here. You want that hokey shit. Both companies have problems. Tons of problems. Yeah. Both companies have a lot of shit I really enjoy. Someone someone added me on TikTok and said, do you enjoy anything? I was like, man, I enjoy it all. Yeah. But that doesn't mean I'm not going to be hypercritical of it. Mm-hmm. Of certain things you don't I'm like. I'm going to call out. The problem is, is in the world we live in, it's, it's not entertaining to talk about your love fest with something. Mm-mm. If I sit here and tell everybody, oh, man, I fucking, I love Roman Reigns and, and that story. And I love... Uh, Brian Danielson and Kenny Omega. Nobody listens. They don't fucking care. No, they the only time people, button. the only time people listen is when I'm bitching and complaining about the things I don't like. So more often than not, I talk about the shit I don't like. Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, last but not least, where do you think Braun Strowman's going? I see. I... Is he going to still wrestle? Because I see he's like living his best life on Instagram. Yeah. Um. You know, I think if he went anywhere, it would be AEW. But other than that, I, I don't know where he belongs. You know, yeah, I just where he's so big. That, that roster is getting fuller. And I agree. Fuller I feel like it's just like WWE and fuller, leftovers. And, I, and I'm going to talk about that in the next topic. So let's jump on to topic number three. All right. So CM Punk has been pretty media friendly since returning to AEW. Uh, he's taken any chance he can to talk to the media and tell them how much he loves AEW, and he takes uh, any chance he can get to take subliminal and not so subliminal shots at WWE. In a recent article for Sports Illustrated, Punk uh, likened AEW to a punk rock band playing in a bowling alley. <laughs> punk went on to say that the AEW is the indie company with the backing of TNT. The question is, does AEW really still have that indie vibe with all of the WWE and big name signings they've had in the last six months? <clears throat> so you just said it. Yeah. And I fought this, I fought this opinion for a long time, but it's getting harder and harder and harder to fight. Mm-hmm. At this point, AEW has a lot of WWE talent. And I went on to the AEW.com roster. Yeah. And I went through and I wanted to make a list of guys who were at one time decent stars in WWE mm-hmm. that are now featured on uh, AEW. Some okay. of these are stretches because they, the guys who started with AEW from the beginning, it's hard to blame them, but they're still WWE guys, right? So we got Cody Rhodes. Yeah. WWE guy. Yeah. CM Punk. Yeah. WWE guy. Malachi Black. WWE guy. Brian Danielson. Bobby Fish. Chris Jericho. Matt Hardy. Andrade. Pac. Billy Gunn. Big Show Paul Wright. Christian. Dustin Rhodes, Jake Hager, John Moxley, Leo Rush, Miro. It's a long list. That's a lot of the guys that are featured on TV every week. Mm -hmm. It's hard to fight the argument that AEW is WWE 2.0. And if you are like good stars and some are like WWE leftovers to me. Yeah, you, I mean, I guess you can make that argument. That's not the argument I'm trying to make. The argument I'm trying to make is... When you go, we're the indie company. You were the indie company. There was a time when you had Sammy Guevara on every week and you had Darby Allen on every week and you had MJF on every yeah. week. And those were the guys putting the company on their back and carrying it forward. Now you're banking on CM Punk. Now you're banking on Brian Danielson. Mm-hmm. Now, I, I didn't list Adam Cole. 
Now you're banking on Adam Cole, right? These are the guys you're putting the company on the back of, and it feels a lot less indie to me. Yes. It just feels like another option. I'm even better with the idea that it feels old school. It feels more like the attitude error. Mm-hmm. Less, less camera work going on. More about the wrestling and less about the story, which yeah. I'm not a big fan of, but I see why that feels good to me, right? Like where certain people feel good about that. But CM Punk coming out and saying, AEW is the indie punk band at the bowling alley. First off, yeah. I've never seen a band at the bowling alley I thought was even fucking decent. I've never okay? seen a band at the bowling so, alley, period. Well, I've seen bands at a bowling alley, and they're usually fucking trash. They're guys who can't get a gig anywhere else. Mm-hmm. And if that's what you want to liken yourself to, that's not something I want to uh, to fucking... Be compared to? Yeah, right. Like I don't want to compare myself to like something that's not the top. And I guess if you're cool with being like... Well, we're not the best. We're just the guys at the bowling alley. That's yeah. cool. Like, you live your best life, CM Punk. But as far as I'm concerned, like, the minute you start calling yourself a hipster and you start calling yourself indie is the minute you're no longer hipster and you're no longer indie. True. It's the same way I feel about Austin, Texas, right? Mm-hmm. There was a time when Austin, Texas was a really cool city and it was weird and it was different and it was a fucking crazy place to go to. Now, Austin, Texas is trying to manufacture that same fucking thing. They even have bumper stickers that say, keep Austin weird. The minute you start calling yourself weird, you're not weird anymore. You're now yeah. manufacturing that feeling. So what it says to me is AEW is trying to manufacture this indie feeling. And it's not translating with me, at least, when you have CM Punk, Brian Danielson, Adam Cole, uh, Chris Jericho, John Moxley. Those people don't feel indie to me. Yeah, for sure. Now, maybe they're booking more indie style and maybe the matches take an indie feel, but it, it feels to me like a bunch of guys who left the the NBA and they go start a pickup league on the side and they go, well, we're going to run it our way. We're going to do it the way we want. That's great. But if you can't take all of the eyes away from WWE, which more and more the, the ratings are starting to kind of slip away from AEW. Yeah. I don't know what you're doing. I don't know what you're doing. Like, They got the big pop from CM Punk and that pulled a lot of eyes, Mm -hmm. but they didn't capitalize on that. I told you the weeks after that, look, CM Punk's got a shelf life of of how hot he can be. Mm -hmm. If you don't come in, even if he didn't have to wrestle, you just should have used him in that dickhead mentality. Let him talk his shit. Let him keep fucking shitting on WWE. Let him have that, that just that, that heel swag then I think they could have capitalized on it, but he's he's lost his heat. He was just too nice. He's cooled off. It, no, I'm not excited to watch CM Punk because he's no. not spectacular in he's the ring. He's not a great wrestler right now. He's not spectacular. You, you, when you take seven years off, you're not going to be spectacular anymore. Sure. So he's not spectacular in the ring. The Darby Allen match was decent. Uh, then he just went through the who's who's of mid-carters. And, oh, he's putting eyes on the mid-carters. That's great, but it's not it's not translating. At this point, they they need ratings, and they need to. CM Punk needs to be, he needs to be drawn in eyes every week to CM Punk and not to other people. Uh, then there's the argument that well, you know, AEW is the real wrestling, right? That's what I told you about in the last segment. Yeah. If you think for one minute that TNT doesn't want sports entertainment and they want real wrestling. You're, you're fucking out of your mind. In the same way that Fox thought they were going to get SmackDown and go, mm-hmm. oh, it's going to be more about like real sports, real wrestling. No, that's not, that's not what people are tuning in for. That's not what a majority of your audience wants to see. They want sports entertainment. And yeah. I said this before, this stupid argument that keeps being brought up to me of, well, there's, there's sports entertainment and there's wrestling. Sports entertainment and there's wrestling. No, no, no. There's sports entertainment, which is anything that's on TNT, it's on USA, it's on Fox. That's sports entertainment. Wrestling, real wrestling, is the shit that happens in a UFC ring. Real wrestling is what happens in the Olympics, right? It's what you see in college. Yeah. AEW doesn't have real wrestling. No. AEW has sports entertainment. They just present it in a different fucking way, right? Mm -hmm. Look at Roads to the Top. If you don't think they're trying to sell storylines and drama, that's what AEW is trying to sell. They're not trying to sell 
you know, hardcore wrestling. They're trying to sell, they're trying to give you this indie vibe, which mm-hmm. I don't, you know, once again, I said, I'm not that dumb. I'm not buying into the indie vibe. You need to just feel it because you feel it. Yeah. You're being told to feel it. I actually was enjoying AEW more before the big three, the influx of Brian Danielson, uh, Adam Cole, and CM Punk, which individually I am fans of all three of those guys. I like CM Punk. But CM Punk, you, you got to have grumpy CM Punk, right? Mm-hmm. I like Brian Danielson. I think that they thrust him into the main event way too quickly, and then they pulled him out. I like Adam Cole. I never noticed. But he's kind of trapped. He's yeah. trapped at this point, right? Because he's part of the elite. And what it looks like to me is like Adam Cole's having a lot of fun. Mm-hmm. The young bucks are having a lot of fun. But I don't know if that translates to the crowd all the time. Right. Cause I think they're just having fun hanging out together, but I don't know. It's not translating to me of like, this is great wrestling. I just, this is, I can't miss this. And so the only thing that still feels indie to me in AEW is just the size. It's the size of the wrestlers, right? True. Darby Allen, small oh, itty bitty boys, Sammy Guevara, small Adam Cole, small, uh, Pac, small John Silver, small, you know, the inter the, all these internet buffoons. They, I think they're the ones who tainted my view on AEW. Yeah, I actually think I let them sit and talk, and they did this thing where they they forced everybody. They want everybody to choose a side. Mm-hmm. Why can't you just be a fan of pro wrestling? Why can't you like both sides? Yeah, I don't understand why you have to. You have to choose. The WWE is one product, and I enjoy that. And AEW is one product, and I enjoy that. Right. AEW feels like nerd wrestling porn, though. Did I you th- just call it nerd wrestling porn? I mean, that's kind of what, I mean, that's the way they fucking try to lay it out, right? You heard it's it like, first here, ladies and gentlemen. Well, that's what they try and lay it out as, is like nerd wrestling porn. It doesn't feel like, uh, yeah, I guess, whatever. Let's move on. <laughs> <sighs> Where were we at here? Number four. Uh, so Goldberg has announced that he has one final match left on his WWE contract. Contrary to popular opinion, uh, it seems that I was one of the few people who thought that his match at Crown Jewel was doo-doo. Okay. Uh, it was boring. It was confusing. I don't I don't even understand why you bury Bobby Lashley like that, but okay, right? So at the spry young age of 54, my question is, are there really wrestling fans that get excited to see Goldberg wrestle still? I mean... And if he's going to get one final match... Who should be the person to lay the old man to rest? Ooh. So I have a strong appreciation for someone who is 54 years old and can still do what he does. Yeah. That's impressive, right? But there's yeah. there's a difference to me in what I consider impressive and what I consider to be entertaining. Okay. A 54-year-old man who runs around in underwear and tackles people, uh-huh. it's impressive. Is it entertaining? Yes. No, not anymore. Not not to me, right? Wrestling is a young man's sport. You can spin it any way you want. And the argument that WWE has an age problem is a is a very appropriate argument. When yes, you start definitely. seeing like Damian Priest is in his 40s. You is start he really? seeing Yeah, he's old or 38, 40s. He's old. Damn. He's old, right? Sheamus, old. Uh Goldberg, old. Bobby Lashley, old. These guys are old. Batista. Batista doesn't wrestle anymore. Tistas and movies, <laughs> but it is, a, it's a young man's sport. You have to transition. You have to layer your layer, your company, right? Layer your, your federation. You got to have different ages at different points. It's why, uh, when Ric Flair, triple H, uh, Randy Orton, uh, when they had their little faction going, it worked. Cause it was a, it was a literal interpretation of this is like the past, present and future of yeah. pro wrestling. Yes. It's the same reason why I say CM Punk doesn't have time to waste in AEW. He's he's knocking on what, what is he forty years old? Yeah, that's crazy. He's forty something years old. Yeah. It, it's not long before you look down at the fucking watch and you're fifty years old. Mm-hmm. You don't have a lot of wrestling years, and I think he's an old forty. I think his body has wear and tear. I don't think he's a spry young forty. There's some guys that are old that you go like Rey Mysterio's old. He's still flying around that motherfucking ring, but he also looks like he takes extremely good care of his body, right? 43. 40, Rey Mysterio? Uh, no. How old's Rey Mysterio? Uh, let me check right CM now. CM Punk's 43. Yes, he That's is. what you're saying? Yes, he is. Okay, so CM Punk's 43, but he's an old 43. Who? <clears throat> Rey Mysterio. How old is Rey Mysterio? <clears throat> 
Um, 46. 46. So mm-hmm. he's older than CM Punk. Mm-hmm. There you go. I mean, Ray still has a motor. Ray can still go. But these one-offs, uh, when legends come back, that's fun. Yeah. I enjoy seeing a legend come back for one match. When they come back for one match, that that's entertaining. I What I don't need is a 54-year-old wrestler explaining to me why he's going to kill another man because his son chose to jump bitch. into a WWE ring and attack a wrestler and the wrestler retaliated, right? Yeah. That doesn't make sense to me. Get Stay the fuck out of the ring. I agree with you. If you jump in the ring, that's that's where business is handled. That's mm-hmm. where grown man handle business. And if you wouldn't have got your ass whooped in the first place, Goldberg, you, you wouldn't have had to fucking worry about it. Uh, but Crown Jewel confused me. Right, because he literally thre- Goldberg literally threatened to kill Bobby Lashley. That was the yeah. whole the whole build up to that match was I'm gonna kill you. Yeah, that's what he kept saying, right? Oh God, and in a, in a no holds bar, I can kill you. That's yeah. what he kept saying with that fucking weird look on his face. Yeah. And then the match ends. He spears him off of the ramp, uh-huh. through some tables, and walks off. I mean, I think if I got a man down like that. That's the perfect time to kill him. He okay. should have gone for the kill. He should have continued the brutality, and we should have got like a snapped Goldberg at least of like a psychopath. He just walked off. So that match literally confused me. Literally confused me that we're burying Bobby Lashley. We're just going to bury him. I get it. This was, I mean, this has been like the redemption tour for Goldberg, I guess, because of all his fucking botched matches. Cough, cough, <laughs> uh, when he fought The Undertaker at Crown Jewel in 2019. Yeah. I guess this was like redemption for that. But if we're going to get one final Goldberg match, who's it going to be then? Ooh. Uh, So I had, I had three thoughts and two were pretty stupid. I mean, one is Roman Reigns. You could feed him to Roman Reigns because Roman needs the big names to, to kind of solidify this title run. He needs that list. I saw a list of, uh, let me pull it up. I saw a list of like his victims from the last, uh, from this last title reign. I have it right here. Where did it go? Here it is. So he's he's beaten The Fiend, Braun Strowman, uh, Jay Uso, Kevin Owens, Daniel Bryan, Cesaro, Rey Mysterio, Edge, John Cena, Finn Balor, Brock Lesnar. Goldberg would be a nice addition to that list. Notch in the belt. <sighs> then you could jump over to the Raw side and uh, Big E could benefit from it, right? Because... The thought process is Big E's probably going to, he'll probably go over on Seth Rollins, even though I think that's iffy. Seth Rollins is on fucking fire. Yeah. Uh, so, but Big E could benefit from from a win against Goldberg. But I think the the thing that makes the most sense, if, if we're going to retire Goldberg, it would be to put Riddle in the ring with him. Ooh, that would be a they, good they've one. Had, they've had this ongoing beef for a long time. Where really? Riddle, Riddle disrespected Goldberg. And it's kind of, it's played out through the internet, especially where Riddle has continued to kind of take shots and poke at Goldberg. Maybe they've had it set up this whole time. Mm, It seems like Goldberg's kind of a dick. I don't think he wants that match. I don't think he wants to put over Riddle, but I think ultimately putting over Riddle at WrestleMania would be phenomenal. Yeah. It would be the ultimate kind of go away. You know, on your last match, you kind of put over somebody to give them that nod. Brock Lesnar. Well, you're just saying crazy things now. But why do, would you put over Brock Lesnar? No, but I'm saying Brock Lesnar versus Goldberg. No, that would I, they've done that match. It was terrible. It was like five minutes long because neither <laughs> one could, could work that long. That's that's a terrible idea. I would not put them back in the ring together. I think it should old be old versus old. I think so. It too. should be Riddle, really good. Riddle match. at WrestleMania would be a, a good final match for Goldberg. Yeah. All right. Number five. Uh, I don't know why this is doing that. I don't. All like right, that. number five. Number five. Five is divine. On this past Friday, SmackDown, for the first time in what seems like a long time, we got an injection of new blood into the women's division. Uh-huh. We got to see Shotzi Blackheart under the bright lights with Charlotte Flair and yes. Sasha Banks. The question is, what is the ceiling for Shotzi Blackheart? Is she a main event contender or pretender? Okay. So this is a weird one for me because I don't have a deep experience with watching Shotzi Blackheart. Me this, neither. This was kind of the introduction for me. I've seen her a couple times on, I think, NXT. She drives the tank out. Uh-huh. She shoots the missile. Crowd she came favorite. Out in like a Royal Rumble. The crowd right? loves her. Yeah, I think she came out in the Royal Rumble is probably mm-hmm. where we saw her too. Uh, or 
in some, I don't know if that was a Royal Rumble. I don't remember, but we have seen her. We have seen her, but this was my first like eyes on her in a, in a big time fight. Mm -hmm. Uh, And then she turns heel right off the bat. They go with a heel turn with somebody who's kind of beloved by the crowd. It was an odd thing to turn her heel that quickly. Cause I don't know. So now I'm going to start looking at the SmackDown roster of women, right? Yeah. And the top three, or, or, or I guess apparently the top three are going to be Sasha Banks, Charlotte Flair, and it looks like they're inserting Shotzi into this storyline, right? Yes. Heel, heel, heel. Or are we turning? Are we turning? Was that meant to turn Sasha Banks into a face? Which I don't know if anybody has any sympathy for her right now. I mean, I don't. I don't yeah. think she's in the mode. I don't to think get, I felt that. Right. I didn't get that either. Because I guess she was cheering Shotzi on. Well, but that would have been that would have been a fate a baby face move, right? She's okay. cheering for the other baby face because coming into that match, Shotzi mm-hmm. was a beloved uh, character, yeah, and she was a baby face. Mm-hmm. Then she turns on Sasha Banks at the end. It's weird. It's weird. I don't fully understand this one, and people can explain this to me because I get. I guess what I'm supposed to take away from that was Sasha Banks turning face and Shotzi's turning heel. Um. She could have been a fresh baby face, though, I think. I think she could have played that role well. I liked her. Uh, no matter what it is, though, she seems like a breath of fresh air. I, I enjoyed the match. I thought the match was a change of pace. I feel like every week for the last six weeks, we've gotten some some iteration of Bianca, Becky, Sasha, and Charlotte. Uh-huh. So it was nice to just insert another person into that mix and go, I there are other people who can challenge for this belt. Mm-hmm. Uh, but Charlotte seems a little bit checked out to me. You think <laughs> I, so? I do. I, I felt like just, she, you got to look at it from this standpoint, right? They got rid of her dad. They got rid of her husband. She's there on an island all by herself. If true. the rumors are all true and nobody really likes her, nobody wants to work with her. And yeah. you got people who want to fight her in the back. It's got to be miserable. That's a lonely road. You're traveling constantly. You're all by yourself. You're probably eating by yourself. You're probably hanging out by yourself. You, you, at a certain point, you just go, hey, man, fuck this. This, is, this sucks, right? Yeah. And then you look over and you go, you go see your husband and he's telling you, hey, man, Which AW, fun. everybody kind of enjoys this thing. True. Like everybody's having fun. And I think she probably got to the point where she was like, well, I probably have more fun over there. I don't care if it's a pay cut. I don't care if it's less prestigious. There's certain people who she kind of climbed the mountain. What more is there for her to do in WWE? The most decorated woman in sports. I mean, what? Win, win the seventh, the seventeenth championship? Yeah, that's a big deal, I guess. But <laughs> but who cares? It's probably better to go be with your husband and have fun. True. Once they got rid of her dad, I think there was just nobody for her to hang out with. Yeah. I think there's a big chance Charlotte drops the belt before Survivor Series. True. So I they think, can give it to somebody else. Yeah, I think there's a chance that at Survivor Series we get like Becky Lynch versus Sasha Banks. I could see that happening. Or even it would be interesting for someone like Shotzi Blackheart to sneak in and, and steal the title. That'd be fun. True. That That'd, would be interesting. That would remind me of like Paige's debut where she came in and, and won the belt in like the first her first night. But yeah, uh, I I think I, I saw rumors that maybe they'll release Charlotte. I just, okay. I don't think that's happening. I think they're going to torture they need her. that cash cow. No, nah, it's not about that. I think they're just going to torture her for the next, you know, however long, I don't know what she's got left on her contract, but I imagine that they will just have her look like a fool. They will try to beat down her character so that when she does leave, she won't have the prestige. If she leaves now, she can leave and go to AEW and be like, I'm still fucking Charlotte Flair. Yeah. If they make a fool of her for the next year or two years mm-hmm. and then she leaves, they can go, yeah, we were done with her. Yeah. We were sure. done with her a long time ago. Uh, next question here is, I got to get this better where it doesn't do that. Uh, this past Friday on, no, that's not it. It's this one. Last night on Monday Night Raw, it has never been more apparent why the draft is such a necessary tool for the WWE. I've seen new life breathed into Monday since my Raw detox ended from Seth Rollins to Finn Balor. But no one has been more impressive to me than Kevin Owens these last two weeks. My question is, though, who has been the most impressive Raw acquisition from the 2021 draft and who is the new face of Monday Night Raw? 
Okay. So I'll run down a list here. Bianca Belair. She's held it down since she's come to Monday Night Raw. She's, it's been fresh. It's been exciting. It's given me a reason to watch. But it's been what I said at the beginning. She's just mm-hmm. been cheated out of match after match after match. And she keeps coming up short. So really, you can't be the face of Monday Night Raw if that's the case, yeah. right? Like I said earlier, she needs something fresh to focus on. Go rack up some wins somewhere and then come back and, and kind of claim your stake. Because I think True. she could have been the face of Monday Night Raw. They could have hitched the wagon to her and, 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 and done something. I don't know how old she is, but uh, she seems more youthful, even just from a perspective, right? Yeah. How Second on my it? list. You don't, you don't have to look it up. Okay. Second on my list is Austin Theory. Okay. Now, I don't think he's the face of WWE, but I think he's my sleeper acquisition of the 2021 draft. I like him. Right? It's been fun to watch uh, him. I didn't have a lot of watch time before. I think Me I had too. only seen him In the when we watched that stupid wedding scene on NXT, the right? That was, that's the only time I've ever seen him, and he was just playing like a dumb guy. Uh, but thank God he's making a fool out of uh, boring-ass Dominic Mysterio. I that man is Dominic so Mysterio. boring. If you want to talk about he's the, not a man. You want to talk about the worst acquisition. He's a boy, Dustin. You want to talk about the worst acquisition of the 2021 draft. It's, yeah. It's definitely Dominic Mysterio. Definitely. Uh, then we got Queen Zelina. So I, I told you when we were watching Monday Night Raw, I love the way she drops in and out of the British accent. Fuck yeah. I don't know if people are catching on to that, but it's fucking I great. I mean, if you're the not catching just, on to it. She just slides in and out of it. It's, it's yes. fucking perfect. I thought that Carmella would be a better queen, but I'm starting to think that pairing her up with Carmella was the proper way to go. It, it does. Someone told me this and this was the right thing. The, the queen and king of the ring is usually used to build up a character who's not built up. Okay. Well, I think that could have applied to Carmella, but I also think that letting Zelina get that rub off of Carmella, yeah. I, I see what they're doing. I okay. like what they're doing. They're making her like a more apparent figure. Well, they're just, the, the, it's the, the beauty queen that I was talking about with Carmella. Uh-huh. They're just doing it together. It's sure. like they're both queen. They're like both talking friends. their shit, right? Yeah. Nikki Ash is the worst character in WWE. Oh, I hate her. I cannot. I don't know, man. Her. That was she just uh, she just rubs me wrong. I don't it, like her she's, outfit. She's trying so hard to be the anti, like women's wrestler. Because I don't know what is the, the the mask stands for. You can be whatever you want to be. Wouldn't that be the opposite? You're hiding behind a mask. Yeah, you're true. like ashamed of who you are. I guess true. I don't know. I'm not gonna see it. Fucking break that down right now. Analyze but, but it. To me, Nikki Ash is the worst character in the WWE. Okay. All right, Kevin Owens. This mm-hmm. is my guy, man. This is I, I'm hyped up right now. Now, Kevin Owens. I don't know if you caught it. He slid in there. He said, "I either got three months left or three years." No, I did not. So he's touch alluding that. to the fact that you know they better start doing something with him, or he's he's walking out the fucking door. His intensity has been cranked up to fucking eleven. I mean, he came out during that ladder match and just banged his head against the ladder and started the match bleeding. Well, he's pretty fucking crazy. Uh, I don't know if they're if they're building towards a heel turn. It looks like they were building towards a heel turn at the end of Monday Night Raw. Mm-hmm. It was either him or Big E. One of them is, is leaning towards a heel turn. I'm guessing it's going to be Kevin because yeah. Big E as a baby face is just no. too profitable for WWE right now. Annoying he baby may baby. And, and Kevin Owens may not be the face of the WWE yeah. or, or Monday Night Raw, but he's the fucking motor right now that's pushing it forward. Mm-hmm. He's making those main events fun. He's making them fun to watch. He's stealing the show every week. Where Seth Rollins is just fucking gold, right? Yeah. And 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 Seth Rollins is is fucking great. But Kevin Owens, uh, I feel like first off, his work on the microphone. There's something about a guy who doesn't give a shit that just elevates them. And this, I think this is what happened to CM Punk. When CM Punk stopped giving a shit in WWE, he raised his stock through the fucking roof because now he's just saying all this shit. That's like, Oh, did he really say that? Kevin Owens is starting to get that vibe to me and it's hard. I don't know why the WWE doesn't try to manufacture that vibe more often. Right? Just tell Kevin Owens, go out there and vent your grievances. Just go out there and talk your shit. Yeah. Just do say whatever the fuck you want to say, because the fans are going to eat that shit up. Just go do it. Right. Guys are dangerous when they don't give a shit when they, you know, I, he's, he's cussing a lot. Right. Yes. I've noticed that. But, but when he starts cussing a lot, it's because what, what, what you gonna fucking fire me? I got three months left on my contract. What are you gonna do? Fire me. You're not going to fire me. 
So then, like I said, Seth Rollins. I feel like Seth Rollins is, he's on top of the game right now. Everything he's doing is just hitting the fucking mark. Even coming out of a loss with Edge, it like it doesn't even affect no, his he's character. Seth fucking Rollins. And unfortunately for Big E, I think Seth is going to be the downfall of Big E's title run. Because I don't know how long we can sit and pretend that Seth Rollins shouldn't be WWE Raw champion. I don't know. I just don't know. It's, I think it's only a matter of time. It, it's a matter of when does he win the title now. Yeah. It's when do they decide to put the title back on Seth Rollins. He's Like I say, he's a total package. Everything about him, his fucking entrance is gold. The, the suits get a pop from the crowd. He, he plays off of Big E. He plays off of Kevin Owens. He, he talks, ah, he's got the laugh. He's got everything, right? He doesn't need the belt, but it feels like the belt needs him. That's what it is to me. It feels like the belt needs, um, it needs Seth Rollins. Last question here. Let's see. This past Friday on SmackDown, we were given word that the top of the uh, we were given on word on top of the well deserved suspension of Brock Lesnar, Adam Pierce has tacked on what I have to assume is the largest fine in the WWE history. One million dollars. Roman Reigns was a no show for SmackDown this week. The question is, how can Roman and the bloodline sift through and navigate the aftermath of Brock's juvenile and bully uh, outburst that got him suspended and uh, and left SmackDown in disarray? So what, what is basically the question is, how, how does Roman Reigns navigate this? And there's multiple webs to untangle here, right? Okay. The first is the absence of uh, Roman Reigns on Monday Night Raw. I mean, on, on Friday Night SmackDown, right? Yeah. A lot of people, a lot of people were trying to say he was scared. Uh, scared well, yeah. to be at SmackDown, okay. right? Come on, man. A lot of people were saying he's injured. Came out of a brutal battle with, with the Beast, and you might need some time off. But I was able to place a call to someone close to Roman Reigns, one of my informants. Okay. Inside the WWE. I was able to place a call. I was able to get in touch with them. Yeah. And they informed me that Roman Reigns was told by the WWE just to lay low this week because they were going to drop the $1 million fine. Mm. So they said, look, Roman, just take the week off. Go cool off. Let this, let this situation cool down. You need to just chill. Stay in the back. You can come to SmackDown, but just, just take it easy. So I've been told that the tribal chief was just in the back studying, preparing tape, watching tape on Big E, starting to prep for that match, even though yeah. WWE hasn't acknowledged it. To yes, our best knowledge, that match still exists. Mm -hmm. Roman Reigns versus uh, Big E at Survivor Series, right? Okay. So, so I just want to get that out of the way. I want everybody to know that's what was going on there. So then we got to discuss Paul Heyman, okay? Yes. Because in that segment with Caleb Braxton, you know, I think people are getting worried that he's forgetting where his allegiance stands, that he's not with the tribal chief, that he slipped into a moment of thinking he's still the advocate for the beast Brock Lesnar. That, that's not what I take away from that. I think that Kayla Braxton, who is clearly infatuated with Paul Heyman, yeah. she finds every opportunity to reach out to Paul in the back of SmackDown and talk to him. I think she has baited him. I think she has poked and prodded him until she got him to to go into just a kind of a state of delusion, right? He just he just flipped a switch, he went off. Maybe he had a, a, a lapse and and kind of forgot what what he's doing, where mm -hmm. who his allegiance is to. But I don't think I don't think it's a sign of things to come. Okay, I, I don't I just don't think Paul's going to turn on the tribal chief. Why? That's where your bread is buttered. Why are you going to you, you hit your wagon to a horse? You got it. That, that's the that's the thoroughbred, Roman Reigns, right? He's not going to forget who the greatest universal champion of all time is. No. He's just not going to forget it. And like I said last week, the suspension of Brock Lesnar was the only answer for the bullying that he did. I mean, he hit True. a cameraman. Yes, he, hit he a, did. He hit Adam Pierce, a WWE mm -hmm. official. He, he pushed referees. He was out of line. He was, you know, the suspension. And now the $1 million fine. Thank you. Thank you, Adam Pierce. Thank you. This is the first, I mean, there's too many times in the history of the WWE that guys have gotten out of control and has gone unhandled. This is the first time that someone stepped in and it took someone like Adam Pierce to step in, lay down the law, and drop a $1 million fine. That's, that's fast, swift, and just punishment. 
Yes, Maybe sir. next time Brock will think twice before doing this juvenile shit. True. Maybe he'll think twice before putting his hands on a cameraman and destroying WWE property. Maybe he'll think twice. Who knows, right? Maybe. <laughs> but let's let's face it, right? Because Roman Reigns destroyed the beast at Crown Jewel. And that yes. obviously led to this downfall and this, this mental breakdown of, of Brock Lesnar. And Roman Reigns deserves this time to rest. He yeah. deserves this time to focus on the road ahead, which is paved in gold as he rides in 428 days strong Ooh. as the WWE Universal Champion, the greatest universal, scratch that, the GOAT. The GOAT. The greatest champion of all time. And these fucking internet wrestling nerds need to just shut their fucking mouth, put down their fucking Pop-Tarts and Capri Suns, Ooh, that sounds good. come out of their mom's basements, and acknowledge that the tribal chief is the greatest, the GOAT, the greatest champion of all time. He is the head of the table. He is the one. He is Roman Reigns. This has been another episode of the seven burning questions with the wrestling savant. Make sure to like and subscribe to the channel. Hit the hit us up on TikTok to leave a comment and get the conversation going. As always, I am the savant. And Savior Nerdy D, that is the Lioness Lauren, and let's ring the final bell. Ladies and gentlemen, making his way to the mic, he is the pro wrestling savant, the host of the hottest wrestling podcast.